Today we're going to talk about bifurcations. But before we do so, let's review what we discussed last time about equilibria and the phase line. Recall that a first order equation is an equation of the form dy dt equals f of ty. An initial value problem is a first order differential equation with the extra condition that y of t0 is y0. A function y of t is said to be a solution if y prime of t equals f of t y of t. A separable equation is a first order equation where f of ty is the product of two functions g of t times h of y. An equilibrium solution of a separable equation is a constant function y of t equals y0, which is a solution. That is, h evaluated at y0 equals 0. An autonomous equation is a separable equation where g of t is a constant function. Since we're, we will focus on autonomous equations, we'll always write them in the form dy dt equals f of y. That is, we'll simply suppress the notation involving t. Say that y of t is a solution to an autonomous equation. Then the limiting value, y0, that is the limit as t increases without bound of y of t, must satisfy f of y0 equals 0. This means that every solution y of t to an autonomous equation must tend to an equilibrium solution y equals y0. But how do we determine which of these equilibrium solutions it approaches? We discussed the logistic growth model to get some intuition behind what's happening here. On your screen, you see phase diagrams, but you also see what are called phase lines. To draw these, we go as follows. First, draw a vertical number line, which represents the y-axis. Second, place dots at the equilibrium points y0. And third, in the regions between the dots, either draw an upward arrow or a downward arrow, depending on whether f of y is positive or f of y is negative in this region. Recall that an equilibrium point is a real number y0 such that f of y0 equals 0. Every equilibrium point gives rise to an equilibrium solution, y of t equals y0, as a constant function. Say that y0 is an equilibrium point. We'll denote i plus as those values y that are just above y0, and i minus as those values y which are just below y0. We'll say that y0 is a sink if our graph f of y is greater than 0 when we're just below y0, and is less than zero if we're just above y zero. That is, it looks like our function f of y is decreasing. We'll say that y zero is a source if f of y is less than zero when y is less than y zero, and f of y is greater than zero whenever y is greater than y zero. That is, it looks like our function is increasing. Otherwise, we'll say that our equilibrium point y zero is a node. We have the following theorem, which gives us a much quicker way of determining whether we have a sink or source. Say that y0 is an equilibrium point for our autonomous equation. If f prime of y0 is negative, that is our function is decreasing, then we say that y0 is a sink. If f prime of y0 is positive, then we say that y0 is a source. This is the case where our function is increasing. If f prime of y0 is 0, then we need more information to determine whether we have a sink, a source, or a node. We're going to focus on this case a bit more today. Say that y of t is a solution, and the initial value y at 0 is near some equilibrium point y0. If y0 is a sink, then our function y of t approaches this equilibrium point. On the other hand, if y0 is a source, then our function goes away from our equilibrium point y0. If y0 is a node, then we need more information to figure out the behavior of our solution y of t as t increases without bound. Today, we're going to discuss the concept of bifurcations. Let's start with some motivation. In the 1930s, English scientist and ecologist Michael Graham was concerned about the fishing industry in the North Sea. He realized that as soon as fishermen began fishing for cod, their stocks started to decline, so fishermen brought bigger nets and engines to keep up their profits. 
Unfortunately, by 1939, the North Sea was exhausted and many fishermen were unemployed. This was the inevitable result of unrestrained overfishing. A few years later, in 1943, Michael Graham wrote a book titled The Fishing Gate, where he issued his so-called Great Law of Fishing. That is, fisheries that are unlimited become unprofitable. A few years after that, two English scientists, Ray Beverton and Sidney Holt, came up with a mathematical model to explain this concept of overfishing. The Beverton-Holt model goes as follows. Say that P of T is the size of a certain population of fish, perhaps in the lake or in the sea. Since there are finite resources, there must be a carrying capacity, call it capital N. This means that the logistic growth model does a pretty reasonable job of explaining how the population grows with time. But now let's add in a bit more information. Say that fishermen catch fish at some constant rate, C. Then our logistic growth model can be modified to look like the following initial value problem. dp dt equals some constant k times 1 minus p over n times p minus our constant rate c. We have the following two motivating questions. First, can c be any real number? Or second, is there a maximum value c that we can take on before we overfish a population? To get some ideas behind what this means, let's take a look at some slope fields and some phase lines. Let's go back to this modified differential equation, where essentially we have the logistic growth model, but now we'd like to subtract off some constant rate c. Well, if c is equal to zero, then we have our slope field as usual. You can see here that we've just broken up our slope field into two regions. One is everything below p is equal to n, and you can see here the black line is increasing up to p is equal to n to our equilibrium solution. On the other hand, if we're above, that is p is greater than n, then we've exceeded our resources, so the brown line now slopes downwards to again approach our asymptotic value p is equal to n. Now let's increase our value of c from 0 to 1. You can see here now that the arrows have completely changed. Let's go back. Here c is equal to 0. And now we've increased c, c is equal to 1. Again, you can see how the arrows have flattened out quite a bit. The black line, which originally was increasing our fish population, now has flattened out. The black line is a completely flat line. And the brown line, as before, now is a little bit below where it was before when c is equal to 0. Let's increase c a bit more from c equals 1 now to c equals 1.14. Now you can see the black line, which originally was an increase of population, which then went to a flat population, now is actually a decrease in population. In fact, something similar is happening with the brown line just above that. Let's go back to c is equal to 1. Again, we can see that our line seem to be approaching something flat. But if we increase to c equals 1.14, now we can see that all solutions seem to be decreasing to zero. This is a completely different behavior now that we've increased our value of c. Let's go to a different example. Here we have dy dt equals another quadratic in terms of y, but now we've introduced a new parameter that we're calling here mu. Let's take a look at the case when mu is equal to negative 4. On the left, you can see a phase line, where if we placed in the two dots is our two equilibria solution, namely y equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 5. You can see here that if we have a solution that starts somewhere between these two dots, then the arrow points downward, meaning that our solution now has to decrease. Let's increase mu just a little bit. Now, mu is equal to 0. You can see that our equilibrium solutions, y equals 0 and y equals 2, will still have the same general behavior as before. If we have any solution in between these two equilibrium solutions, then our function, our solution, will decrease down to the lower. Let's increase mu once again. Now we have mu is equal to 2. 
you can see that the equilibrium solution completely went away. And now it's really difficult to predict the behavior of the solutions. In fact, something different is happening. Our solutions seem to be increasing as a function of time. This is very different from what happened before. So what's really happening here? Well, the idea with this differential equation is that the graphs become very different as we move from mu is equal to zero to mu is equal to two. So why is this the case? Observe that the zeros of our quadratic polynomial, y squared minus two y plus mu, yields the two equilibria points, namely y zero equals one plus or minus the square root of one minus mu. In fact, these equilibria points are real numbers if and only if mu is less than or equal to 1. Otherwise, the y0 are complex numbers. This means that if mu is greater than 1, there are no equilibrium solutions. Recall that we define an equilibrium solution as a real number that is an equilibrium value. This gives us a definition. This change in behavior of the solutions from real numbers to complex numbers is typically what we call a bifurcation value. A plot of the phase lines versus the parameter mu is called a bifurcation diagram. Here's a graph to illustrate this. On the screen, you see here mu is on the horizontal axis, and each of the vertical axes is a phase diagram. As we start from the left, let's say maybe mu is equal to negative 5, we can then increase, and as we move all the way up to mu is equal to 1, you can see that the dots, these are our equilibrium points, they get closer and closer together until they collapse on top of each other. Now, as we continue to increase mu, maybe mu going from 1 to 2 to 3, you can see that there are no more dots. Again, as we've increased mu greater than 1, there are no equilibrium solutions. This is because the y zeros in this case are complex numbers, they are not real numbers. This is the idea of a bifurcation diagram. Again, here's the definition, and the following gives a very quick way to determine the bifurcation values of a differential equation. Let's consider an autonomous differential equation, dy dt equals f of y, where our function f depends upon a collection of parameters, maybe mu1, mu2, and so forth then this parameter is a bifurcation value if and only if there exists a complex number y0 such that f of y0 equals f prime of y0 equals 0. So this means not only are we quote unquote finding an equilibrium value, we're actually finding one where the derivative vanishes as well. The whole point here is that we want we will have a system of equations and not only must we solve for y0, but we also are going to solve for the parameters mu as well. Let's give a couple of examples to illustrate this. Let's go back to our quadratic polynomial f of y equals y squared minus 2y plus mu, where mu is a constant. First, let's take the derivative and solve for y0. The derivative in this case is 2y minus 2, so by setting f prime of y0 equals to 0, we can then solve for y0 to find that y0 equals 1. Now, let's plug in y0 into our original quadratic polynomial to find f of y0 equals mu minus 1. We want to set this equal to 0, so this forces mu to be equal to 1. So we conclude that the differential equation dy dt equals y squared minus 2y plus mu has bifurcation value mu equal 1. This explains what we saw in the previous slide, how it seems that in the bifurcation diagram, things became very different for the behavior of our solutions when mu equals 1. Now let's consider the following quadratic polynomial that came from the fishing problem. f of p in this case equals k times 1 minus p over n times p minus a constant c. We can take the derivative and find f prime of p equals negative 2k over n times p plus k. We see that this derivative equals 0 when p0 equals n over 2. We then plug this back into our original quadratic f to find that f of p0 is k times n over 4 minus a constant c. 
So we see that our differential equation has bifurcation value c equals kn over 4. Now let's go back to our original question. What about overfishing? Well, recall that p of t is the size of our population of fish at time t, and that we have a carrying capacity n, where our fish are caught by fishermen at some constant rate c. So we find the differential equation you see on your screen. We've just seen that the bifurcation value of this equation is c equals kn over 4. So now let's discuss case by case. If c equals 0, then we've seen before that p of t tends to our carrying capacity n as t increases without bound. This is simply the case where fish are allowed to thrive without being caught. Now let's increase c just a little bit so that c is non-zero, but it's less than kn over 4. In this case, our population size p of t will not equal to zero even as t increases without bound. This, of course, is the case where fish are being caught, but the catch rate is not that high. Finally, let's see what happens when c is greater than kn over 4. As we've seen in our diagrams, p of t goes to zero as t increases without bound. This is exactly the case of overfishing. That is, the fish will be caught at such a high enough rate that the fishing industry will collapse. So yes, it is very much possible that the catch rate of fish can be high enough that the fishing industry will collapse. We give this quantity a name. The quantity C, which is Kn over 4, is what's called the maximal sustainable yield, MSY. This is the maximal rate in which fish can be caught before there is overfishing. Thanks very much for watching.